I strongly believe this is just one more example of how healthcare for people with a cervix is strongly undervalued. Anything that deals with female sexuality is villainized. Even a vaccine that prevents sexually transmitted infection, which disproportionately causes severe problems and cancer in people with a cervix. Hey y'all, welcome back. Mama Dr. Jones, OBGYN, and mom to four. Today is the second in a three-part series. I know I said two-part last time, but I changed my mind on HPV. Today, we're talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly about the HPV vaccine. Next time, we will do a Q&A. So if you have any leftover comments after the first and second videos, feel free to leave those in the pinned comment below, and I'll try to answer some of them in the HPV Q&A. There's a really interesting psychological phenomenon described by David McGraney in his book, You Are Now Less Dumb, which is called the backfire effect. This is a form of cognitive bias where when we are presented with information that challenges something we used to believe, instead of taking that information, digesting it, and making a new belief, we use that information to say, oh no, see, I've been right about this all along and I don't believe any of the hoopla that you're telling me right now. It's really uncomfortable to change your mind, especially about things that you really strongly believe. I just want to bring that to the forefront so we can all kind of be aware of it, especially when we're digesting the information in part three, the ugly, which will touch on some misinformation about the HPV vaccination. Let's start out this video just by going through a little bit of the history of the HPV vaccine. It came out in 2006 after being developed in Australia and initially only protected against the two most deadly types of HPV and now protects against the nine most common, including those two most deadly types of HPV. It is now approved and universally recommended in over 70 countries around the world. It initially came out as a recommendation only for girls, but within three years of being released, that was expanded to include boys and girls starting around age 12, but can be given safely as early as age nine. It's a three vaccine series, although in recent years we have found that if you get the vaccination under the age of 15, two doses are equally as effective as three. However, if the vaccine is delayed until after age 15, it needs to be done as a three shot series. Thanks to new research in 2018, I believe late 2018, early 2019, it was FDA approved to be given up to age 45, which was an expansion from the age 26 that we were initially using it for. All of these changes represent changes in the research or expanded access access to the medication. The initial recommendation to give it only to girls, for example, was not because we didn't think there was a benefit to boys, but because initially the vaccine was not as widely available and the most cost-effective place to start with the vaccine was with girls who tend to be more heavily affected by the severe side effects that HPV can cause, things like genital warts, and cervical cancer, which we discussed in the last video. Throughout this video, as like the last one, we're going to be focusing mainly on the gynecologic issues that HPV can cause. Okay, so the question I always get at this point is, all right, well, great, why are you giving it to kids so young? Why can't we just wait until they're sexually active? And the answer to this is that the vaccine works significantly better to prevent the infections related to HPV if it's given before there's ever been any type of exposure. I kind of tell parents, look at this like a bike helmet. You don't wait until your kid is actively falling off their bike to scramble and try to put a bike helmet on them. Before they ever leave the house on their bicycle, you put a helmet on them just in case they crash. If they never need it, great. If they do need it, they already have it on. However, that being said, it's important to know that it's still useful and helpful even after the onset of sexual activity. So if you are in the group of people who that was delayed and now you're sexually active and wondering if it makes sense for you to get it, it's still helpful. It's just, if you are a parent thinking about should you get this for your child at age 12, then I would highly encourage you to go ahead and do the vaccine series then. So let's jump into the good, the bad, and the ugly about HPV vaccination. So the good, what are the benefits to this vaccine? Despite less than optimal uptake, meaning relatively low vaccination rates compared to what the goal was, by 2012, which if you'll remember is only six years after this vaccine was even introduced, there was a 50% decrease in the two most common and the two most deadly types of HPV in teenagers in the United States. This is huge. There is a 10 to 15 year latency between being exposed to or getting HPV, the virus, and developing cervical cancer. So we're just now getting into that time frame where we can actually look at cervical cancer rates. But judging by the massive decrease in rates of infection and looking to places like Australia where they had much better 
vaccine uptake and the significant decrease that they've seen in severe HPV related disease, it would only make sense that when these studies come out, we're going to see massive decreases in cervical cancer. And our preliminary data already shows that. In fact, because Australia has done such a great job with this vaccine, they are probably well on their way to almost eliminating cervical cancer. Obviously it's not happening yet, but we have data to indicate that this vaccine could do that. So let's talk a little bit about the actual efficacy rates. How well does the vaccine work? As with any vaccine, nothing is 100%. You're relying on a whole bunch of factors, including your body making the immunity to protect you but it's very good. And a person who is HPV naive, meaning they've received their vaccination well before any opportunity to be exposed to this virus, there is a 97 plus percent rate of protection against HPV related vaginal, vulvar, and cervical dysplasias, 97%. This drops quite a bit to like 50% for people who are exposed prior to the vaccination, but it's still better than none. There's also pretty good evidence that this is effective at preventing or drastically decreasing the risk of HPV associated anal cancers and oropharyngeal diseases as well. Okay, great, we've covered the good. Let's talk about the bad. What are the risks to HPV vaccination? Every iteration of the HPV vaccination has an extensive safety profile, which has been documented in very large clinical trials, as well as extensive post-licensure data collection, meaning information we gathered after the vaccine started being used. From June 2006 to March 2013, 57 million doses of this vaccination were given and tracked in a very large post-licensure data collection series. In that time frame, there were a little over 21,000 adverse events. So what is an adverse event? Well, about 92% of that 21,000 were considered mild, which is basically pain at the injection site. And notably, this is a vaccine that people say is painful when it's given and your arm is sore the next day. 8% were considered serious. So what is serious? This is things like headache, nausea, vomiting, syncope, or passing out at the time the vaccine is given, lightheadedness, etc. The incidence of life-threatening things like anaphylaxis were extraordinarily rare. They are documented, but it is extremely unusual. So like with anything, you can be severely allergic and have anaphylaxis related to a vaccine that would require treatment and oftentimes hospitalization. But that is so incredibly rare. I mean, you can see just by the fact that we considered headache, nausea, vomiting, et cetera, a serious side effect that we were really lacking for very severe or life-threatening side effects to even discuss. Clinically, I would say that lightheadedness or passing out after being given the vaccine are the most common things that we see in addition to the very common pain at the injection site and soreness the next day. The passing out thing is usually prevented by a waiting period. So in my clinic, we will often have patients wait 10 or 15 minutes sitting down after they get the vaccine. And we see this very rarely, but it, it does happen. and. We know that because we see it sometimes and because the data tells us that. Despite what I would consider to be tons of misinformation on this topic, there is no good scientific data that shows any kind of causal relationship between HPV vaccination and long-term health problems like infertility or multiple sclerosis. That is the perfect opportunity to segue into the third section of this video, the ugly, the hordes of ugly misinformation that have caused this vaccine to have extremely poor uptake and unfortunately probably cost some people their lives. Despite extensive research and a safety profile which rivals or exceeds almost any vaccine that we have, only about 50% of US teens are currently vaccinated against HPV. Why? As soon as this vaccine was FDA approved and released for use in the public in 2006, it became a political pawn and also the subject of a very targeted misinformation campaign. Religious entities and extremist conservative groups targeted this as an STD vaccine that the government was trying to push on children. Without the information that I gave in the last video about how common HPV is, how we prevent it, and what it can cause, 
This was a very effective campaign to villainize this vaccine. There were claims that it would make your child promiscuous, which is a silly claim in my opinion to make to begin with, but has also been debunked in multiple studies, which I will link below. And the vaccine was uniquely targeted by anti-vaccination groups with outrageous anecdotal information that had no scientific basis. They left out all the parts about how harmful HPV is and how effective the vaccine is and dedicated entire conferences to talking about the harm of HPV vaccination. I strongly believe this is just one more example of how healthcare for people with a cervix is strongly undervalued and also how anything that deals with female sexuality is villainized, even a vaccine that prevents a sexually transmitted infection, which disproportionately causes severe problems and cancer in people with a cervix. Cervical dysplasia and cervical cancer are some of the most heart-wrenching things I see in my clinic, but this vaccine is so effective at reducing your risk. Please talk to your doctor and see if it's right for you. There've also been claims floating around about teenage depression and suicide related to the HPV vaccine. These are completely unsubstantiated. There is no data that supports any kind of causal link between HPV vaccination and events like depression or suicide. On top of the targeted misinformation campaigns, which I find absolutely disgusting and horrendous because I thoroughly believe that they have cost people their lives or will cost people their lives when those teenagers become the age where cervical cancer is common, I honestly understand the hesitancy. With all of the ugly misinformation out there, it can be so hard to know what the right decision is for your kids. I have four kids. I can wholeheartedly say they will all be vaccinated against HPV when they are at the optimal age for that to happen. If I had to choose a vaccine we were getting rid of, this would be the last one, purely because of how common HPV is and how harmful some of the problems that it causes can be. And I hope that you will take this information, the knowledge that this is me also making a decision as a parent, and think about that when you're making your own health decisions and talking to your own doctor. This vaccine has also been the target of unintentional misinformation. One of the most common things I hear from people who come into my clinic is it's too new or it's not studied enough. This is simply just not true. The vaccine has now been around for almost 15 years and has been safely in use for that entire time. And it also has extensive research and safety profiling that goes along with it. So these are just misinformation, things that are you know told to people and then repeated. And it is our job as healthcare professionals to change that narrative, which is my goal with the last video in this video. And I knew these videos wouldn't be the biggest views on YouTube, but I think this information is really important. So if you hear it and it makes a difference in how you feel about anything, please, please, please consider sending it to a friend or tweeting it or posting it somewhere because this is really important and it truly could save somebody's life. There's also these claims about money for doctors and big pharma, which we can talk about big pharma in a deep dive at some point, but the idea that this is a moneymaker for doctors is just crazy. You know, if you just look at me giving you this information right now, I don't make money on the HPV vaccine. What I would make money on is if all my patients got HPV and I had to do cancer preventing or cancer treating surgeries on them, that is a huge moneymaker. So I don't have any vested interest in preventing you from getting HPV by getting the HPV vaccine, except that I know it can save your life. On the side of big pharma, again, we can deep dive into big pharma at some point, but the point of this is that we have the data that this vaccine prevents the outcome. So where the money is going is really kind of irrelevant because most of the time insurance plans cover this vaccine, you're not out a significant amount of money and it can save your life. We have the data to show us that. I've also linked an interesting news article below about profitability of vaccines for big pharma. And it's interesting that only recently have vaccines even become profitable because they require this extensive research to go into safety profiling like we were talking about. In fact, in the past, many companies, many pharmaceutical companies totally abandoned the research and effort that goes into developing vaccines because they were so not profitable. I think there's a really important point to be made here that we don't wanna stop developing vaccines by villainizing big pharma for making money off of them. Again, the end point of this is the data says it saves lives. So it doesn't really matter when we're talking about should you as an individual get the vaccine, where the money is going and hopefully it's going to support companies that will continue to research vaccines so that we can develop better protection against things like HPV and 
COVID. I mean, this is really important. I hope that your takeaway from this video was that the benefits strongly, heavily, largely, completely outweigh the risks of this vaccine for almost every individual. Talk to your doctor to see if it's right for you. Importantly, this vaccine does not replace cervical cancer screening with pap smears, so please, please, please still see your doctor for routine health checks and pap smears. Thanks for being here today, guys. If you have any lingering questions or comments about the HPV vaccine or HPV in general, please leave them in the pinned comment below and I will try to address some of those in a Q&A on this topic coming up soon. I'll see you next time. Get your pap smears, get your pap smears, get your pap smears. Your gynecologist is your friend.